Welcome back to Treading Water, the podcast. What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled, as always, by my incredible friends and sponsors at Nerd Tees, and welcome to week 12. We are now going to be a dozen weeks deep into this 2019 NFL regular season, and uh, as I kind of mentioned off the top, yet another week of just kind of, eh, you know, the picks were there. Now, on the plus side, straight up, I did turn things around from last week. I mean, back in week 10, I think it was, I only went 5 and 8. Well, I turned that around to a 10 and 4 week 11 straight up. That has me 98 and 63 with the one tie so far on the season. That was the good news from last week's pick. And I, I can't say that there's really bad, bad news, but again, the pick's Against the spread and over under, just treading water last week, we were six and eight in both regards. Six and eight against the spread, six and eight on the totals on the over under. And I think my math has been a little weird in adding up my records. So I did go back to 100% confirm that these are my records. And uh, just again, just making sure that I, I had all my numbers right, because for whatever reason, the math wasn't adding up. Against the spread this season, 73. 87 and 2. So now a full 14 games under 500 against the spread. Really, really not that good. And on the totals, I've now dipped to a game under 500 at 79 and 80 with three pushes on the year. So obviously, we know where the work needs to be done. The straight up picks are okay. Now it's the betting picks. Like the betting picks need to be turned around by the end of the year. And for yet another week, the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks wind up being mostly a reflection of the picks as a whole. I went 3-1 and one straight up, but once again, missed the bronze pick. The bronze pick, I'm now only 4-7 and seven on straight up this year, which is absolutely atrocious. And it's actually a little bit similar, I think, to how we did last season. I think we struggled in that pick last year as well. That game was, of course, I had the Carolina Panthers beating the Atlanta Falcons, and Atlanta put an absolute whoop on Carolina to the tune of 29 to 3 that was disgusting I did correctly tell you to take Oakland over Cincy Buffalo over Miami as well as Minnesota over Denver all of those games ended uh, in proper favor for us but against the spread and over under only went one and three I did correctly tell you to take Buffalo minus five and a half in the gold pick against the spread and did correctly tell you to stay under 49 and a half points in Atlanta, Carolina in the bronze pick. Otherwise, the rest of the picks did not work out. Minnesota failed to cover minus 10 and a half. Oakland failed to cover minus 10 and a half. And obviously where Carolina lost, Carolina did not cover minus five and a half. And in the totals, Minnesota and Denver went over 40, Buffalo and Miami went over 41, and Oakland and Cincinnati stayed under 48 and a half points, got all those wrong as well. In the Bridgewater's Finest and official NFL YouTube prognosticators pick 'em pools, in the Bridgewater's Finest pool, I now sit in 13th place out of 37 people in that pool with 853 out of the 1,279 possible confidence points this season. That's a clip of 67%, and at the very least, it has me in contention. In week 11, I did bring in 84 out of 105 possible confidence points for an exact clip of 80%. A good week, but not nearly enough to win week 11. The winning week 11 pick set came from Davidson Troops, who I don't believe I've called on this show before. 13-1 and one in week 11. Hell of a week for them. And they only missed their two-pointer for confidence points. So 103 out of 105 possible confidence points in week 11. That's a 98% clip. It's one of the better weeks that we've seen this season and was good enough for Davidson Troops to win week 11. Justin V remains the overall leader at 160 and 1 straight up this season, 891 out of 1279 possible confidence points. That's a clip of 70%. However, Justin V's lead in this pool is down to one single point. And there is also four teams that are within four points of Justin V for the lead. The fact that this pool stays so competitive so late in the regular season, it just warms my heart. It just makes me happy. But Justin V for now, still leading the way. 
in the official NFL YouTube prognosticators pick and pool. I'm in a tie for 13th out of 36 uh, pick sets in that league with my 98 straight up correct picks out of the 162 NFL games that have been played so far. That's a clip of 60%. So great. We're back up to 60%. We want to keep pushing towards 65 as the regular season winds down. I did go 10 and 4 again in week 11. So 10 of the 14 games correct. That's a clip of 71%. Shout out to our week 11 winner and now our solo overall leader in the official NFL YouTube prognosticators pick and pool. That's Bubsy's picks. Bubsy also went 13 and 1 in week 11. So 13 of the 14 games correct. That's a 93% clip. And with their 107 games picked correctly straight up, a 66% clip, that has them tops in that pool. So shout out once again to Davidson Troops and Bubsy's Picks and Justin V for winning week 11 and being our overall leaders. Let's take a peek into Fantasy Corner to see how my eight fantasy football teams did in week 11 action. And this is unprecedented for me. This is now back to back weeks where my fantasy roster of teams went a perfect 8 and 0. So I'm 16 and 0 over the last two weeks. Overall, in all of my eight leagues, I am 67 and 21. That's an average of about eight and three to nine and two in all of my pools and i'm sitting no lower than fourth place out of 10 in any league that i'm in this season it has been an absolute banner fantasy football season for me so far and look you can go back three full weeks and i'm 22 and two over the last three weeks in fantasy uh, we're, we're having a nice little stretch here heading towards the fantasy playoffs. So obviously in the Professionals Dynasty Fantasy Football League, as well as the official NFL YouTube Prognosticators Fantasy Football League, I picked up the victories last week, beating uh, Mayfield of Dreams in the Professionals League and Half Moon's Picks in the Progs League. That has me 9-2 and two in the Professionals League and 10-1 and one in the NFL YouTube Prognosticators League. Both of those are good enough for first place in those leagues, and those are the two that really matter. I got Week 12 matchups against Anthony Cormier in the Dynasty League, who was our champion last year, as well as Geo Knows Fantasy in the Progs League. It's a projected win for me in the Professionals League. However, Geo is currently projected to beat me in the Progs League, so I got plenty of work to do, especially in that pool, if I want to stay where I'm at. So Mayfield of Dreams and Half Moon's Picks, thank you so much for the matchups in Week 11. And Tony and Gio, it feels like the Italian connection. Let's do this in Week 12. And I'll take this opportunity, as I always do, to remind you that if you go to the description of the video file on YouTube, as well as the audio file on SoundCloud, iTunes, or wherever you happen to get your favorite podcasts like this one, you can find all of my results from week 11, all of my straight up against the spread and over under plays for week 12 in the NFL. You're going to find information on joining the Bridgewater's Finest or official NFL YouTube prognosticators pick em pools, where it is never too late to get Get yourself shouted out on this show and hey look put your picks up against mine if you win a week i get to talk about you so it's a win-win across the board you can find information on joining the nfl youtube prognosticators facebook page where we talk football all week long and you can find information on my great friends and sponsors at nerd tees Ladies and gentlemen, we are careening recklessly towards Christmas. We are getting closer as the seconds tick by, and it has never been a better time to hit up nerdtees.ca with my promo code BWFINEST. That is going to save you 15% on any order that you make. You're also going to get free shipping on any order in Canada that is over 75 bucks, which is excellent news if you're Canadian. If you're American, two clicks of a button, everything is in US dollars for you and you get an excellent conversion rate on the US dollar. Today's blend I bring to you with a little bit of sadness because it is the last cup of Ontario peaches that I will be having for quite some time. I believe it's currently sold out and I finally reached the bottom of the bag. It's it's a it's a somber occasion, but I 
I toast Ontario peaches and I toast nerd teas. Nerdtees.ca, promo code BWFinest, save your 15%, get your free shipping, find yourself something to love, or find someone you love something to love. You can do it on nerdtees.ca. We now reach the final week of the season that involves bye weeks. We've got Kansas City, Los Angeles, Arizona, and Minnesota on bye this week. From here on out, no weeks off. It's full slates of games from weeks 13 all the way up to the end of the regular season in week 17. So we really need to take advantage of this week, the last week, where it's a shortened schedule. We want to have an excellent result this week. Let's kick things off in Houston, AFC South division matchup, Texans taking on the Colts. Texans and Colts both tied at 6-4 and four atop this division. Right now the Colts do hold the tiebreaker. And the Colts, of note, are unbeaten in this division so far this year. A perfect 3-0. and oh. Colts won last week. Texans dropped a, a brutal game in Baltimore where they got beat 41-7 to in a game that I thought, wow, what a quarterback matchup this is going to be. And it did wind up being that on one side. Colts, meanwhile, won a very comfortable three-possession victory against the returning Nick Foles and the Jacksonville Jaguars, but that matchup was not without loss for the Indianapolis Colts. Colts running back Marlon Mack fracturing his hand. It is confirmed he will not play this week because, I mean, what a quick turnaround that is right to Thursday to try to play with a fractured hand. But the injuries right now is not considered to be season-threatening, so it's in all likelihood, we will see Marlon Mack again this season, and obviously that's good news for a Colts team that is desperately trying to win this division, because if they don't, like, yeah, you're going to probably get a wild card spot in the AFC, the way that it's shaping up. Six and four will probably be good enough to grab probably that second wild card spot, maybe behind Buffalo, but still, you don't want to leave it to chance. You want to win this division. That's what the Colts are trying to do. It's also what the Texans are trying to do, but at the very least this week, they're likely going to have to do that without Justin Reed in their secondary. He suffered a concussion last week, which was originally thought to be a shoulder injury, but on further testing, he does have a concussion. He's in concussion protocol. His status for this game is uncertain, and Justin Reed has been one of the better defenders in the NFL this season, certainly at his position in the secondary for the Texans. That is a big loss for a Houston team trying to keep Jacoby Brissett and a pass game that may be getting T.Y. Hilton back this week, trying to keep them under wraps. Of note, the Indianapolis Colts have won and covered three straight head-to-head -head matchups, division matchups, so obviously that is relevant. They've also won and covered five of the last six head-to-head, -head, dating back to 2017. I got a real good feeling about the Colts this week. They are the underdog in this matchup, but I kind of like them to go, so I'm actually going to take Indianapolis in this matchup. Let's take the Colts on the road in Houston. I think they'll be able to cover up for the fact that Marlon Mack is not in the game. I think they've got the running back depth to be able to do that. Houston has taken so many losses on the defensive side. That's the way I'm going. Colts on the road beat the Texans. On the line, Texans are three and a half point favorites at home, which is an understandable line, but I like the Colts to win here, so I'm more than happy to take those three and a half points. Let's take Indianapolis plus 3.5. Total in the game set at 45 and a half points. This is right around where I capped this, right around a mid to high 40. It's a bit of a lean, but I am going to lean on the over in this matchup. We're going to go over 45 and a half points in Indianapolis, Houston. Let's go Colts 25, Texans 22. We're going to go to Atlanta now, another division matchup. Falcons taking on the Tampa Bay Bucks. Two teams certainly going in different directions over the last couple of weeks. These are the two bottom teams in the NFC South division, both at three and seven, but where the Bucks lost a game last week that I kind of felt they had a, at least an okay chance to win. Very impressive. The Atlanta Falcons, again, that win against Carolina in Carolina, and they have now reeled off two straight wins. I did at least think the Bucks had a chance of beating New Orleans last week. I think I did still pick New Orleans, but I was like thinking like, you know, division matchups, anything can happen. This is another one of those situations where division matchup, absolutely anything can happen. And as the Falcons proved last week, there's still some life in this football team. 
Of note for the Bucks, Jameis Winston injured his ankle late in that game last week against New Orleans. He is expected to play. He did say, claim to the media after the game, like, hey, it's just a little ankle thing. I'll be fine. I would expect Jameis Winston to be limited in this game. And if he is limited at all, this is a Falcons team that's playing really well right now. And a Falcons team that plays the Bucks in particular very well. Atlanta has won five straight matchups head-to-head -head against Tampa Bay dating back to late 2016. And five of the last six head-to-head -head matchups have gone over, including an over on a 57 just last year. You're going to see a lot of points in this game. And if it turns into a track meet... I kind of like the Falcons because they're the team that's going in the right direction here. So let's go with Atlanta. Let's take the Falcons at home in a spot to beat the Tampa Bay Bucks. On the line, Falcons are four and a half point favorites, which seems like one of those lines that I would be in particular interested in possibly hedging my bets on. And if it was a different team, maybe I might. But the Bucs are only 2-8 and eight against the spread this year. I don't think I can sit here and hedge my bets on a team that is, you know, averaging 20% against the spread. Not a lot of money to be made by betting on the Bucks ATS this season. So I'm going to take the Falcons to cover that number. Let's take Atlanta minus 4.5 at home against the Bucks. Total in the game set at 51 and a half points, and this is the easiest layup total maybe that we've had all season. I have this game hitting a low 60, plenty of points. This is going to be a fun football game to watch. And like I mentioned, they've gone over on what was it? Was it five of the last six? Yeah, five of the last six have gone over on bigger numbers than this. So we are going to go over 51 and a half points in Atlanta, Tampa. Let's go Falcons 34, Bucks 27. Let's go to Chicago now where the Bears are going to play host to the New York Giants. Giants coming into this game off of their bye week. Chicago coming in not really knowing who their quarterback is going to be. I've said it multiple times. I have no concerns whatsoever about the Bears on the defensive side of the football. But man, that offense. Like what is, it, it can't just be Matt Nagy. Like, everyone rails on Matt Nagy, and especially if you're uh, Brad Evans, you're like, why isn't David Montgomery touching the ball 846 times a game? It can't just be Matt Nagy. That offense has a complete crisis of confidence right now, and you can watch it just by wa just like just just watching the games you can see this is an offense that has zero confidence in itself right now yeah david montgomery sometimes runs like a man possessed and sometimes runs like a man possessed into three defenders for a two yard gain this is just an offense that has very little to no confidence right now and now like i think they benched trubisky last week in the game against the rams which they lost by 10 points by the way so Who's going to be the quarterback in this game? Is it going to be Trubisky? Is it going to be Chase Daniel? Is it going to be Colin Kaepernick? Nobody really knows who the Bears quarterback is going to be, I don't think, in this matchup. And I've said it before this season, it is virtually impossible for me to bet on a team when I don't know who the starting quarterback is going to be. That's just, it's one of those mental hurdles that I can't really get over. Again, I have no questions about that defense. Statistically, that is the best defense in that division. It's one of the best defenses statistically in the NFC. No question marks about that. But the offense, oh boy. And in the New York Giants, this is an incredibly exploitable defense. This is a defense that you would think an NFL caliber offense should be able to put up a good number of points on. I don't necessarily know that I trust that, do you? Also of injury concern for the Bears, starting right tackle Bobby Massey left the game last week with a back injury. He did not return to that game. His status is uncertain for this week, and if they're missing one of their starting tackles, there are players on that Giants front seven who will be able to get to the quarterback no matter who it is. I kind of like the Giants in an upset here. The Giants have only won one fewer game on the road than the Bears have been able to win in their own home building this season. Granted, the Giants have lost six consecutive games. This is not a good football team right now, but I think the Giants can exploit enough of the Bears that the Giants come up with an upset victory here. So I am grabbing, it's arguably my biggest upset of the week, I am grabbing the New York Giants on the road in Chicago, coming off of their bye, well-rested, to beat the Bears. 
On the line, Bears are quite understandably six and a half point favorites in their own building. Obviously, I like the Giants to win, so I'm more than happy to take that six and a half points. I think that's one of those situations where you hedge either way. Giants plus 6.5 at Chicago. Total in the game set at 40 and a half points. I only have this capped at like a mid 30. I don't think this touches 40 points, so I'm comfortable telling you to stay under 40 and a half points in New York, Chicago. Let's go Giants 19, Bears 17. Let's go to Cincinnati now where the still winless Bengals are going to play host to division rival Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh now on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games. However, they are on the long week as they played on Thursday. That loss for the Steelers can't help but be demoralizing a two-possession loss in Cleveland to division rival the Browns. Then, of course, there was that whole Miles Garrett, Mason Rudolph thing where, look, everyone obviously is piling on Miles Garrett, as they should. A couple of people are kind of talking about how, like, Mason Rudolph did have a role to play in in that in you know it escalating to where it escalated to i don't think what mason rudolph did justified miles garrett swinging a helmet at his head however when they're on the ground and obviously mason rudolph is frustrated they're getting beaten by a team that most people thought they should beat when miles garrett sacks him when they're on the ground mason rudolph shoves him so he, he very clearly shoves them while they're on the ground. So I'm not surprised at all that Miles Garrett was pissed off as they were getting up. That doesn't surprise me at all. It doesn't justify what Miles Garrett did. I hope his appeal fails. I hope he's gone for the rest of the season. I, I get the feeling the appeal is probably going to go through simply on a technicality because you can't technically suspend someone an indefinite number of games for something like this it has to be a specific number of games so i think what the nfl will do is clarify he's suspended for the rest of the regular season so that would be you know how x number of games that that would be for cleveland so i i expect that's the way that it's going to go but i i truly hope we don't see miles garrett play any more football games i'm sorry back to pittsburgh i just had to kind of get that off my chest this game is a very simple one for me. The Steelers still have plenty to play for. They're still only 5-5. Five and five. They've still got a shot at a wild card spot here, despite, you know, not having their top quarterback and despite James Conner having been injured for multiple games. A lot of it has been on their defense. Their defense has actually played quite well this season, certainly in the takeaway department. But uh, at 5-5, five and five, Pittsburgh's still got a shot at this thing, whereas Cincinnati's not trying to win. Their offense isn't trying to win. Their defense isn't trying to win. Scary situation, by the way, for Auden Tate from last week. Looks like he's going to be okay, thankfully. That was a scary, scary, scary situation for the Bengals. But look, Pittsburgh has dominated the Bengals in recent memory. They've won nine straight head-to-head. -head. That goes all the way back to the end of 2015, I think. They've also had three straight and six of the last eight go under on mid-40s. Not going to be a lot of points in this game, but most of those points are going to be on Pittsburgh side. I'm going to take the Steelers here in what feels like a no-brainer. Pittsburgh on the road in Cincinnati beats the Bengals. On the line, Steelers are only six and a half point favorites on the road in Cincinnati. It's under a touchdown. I'm going to be that guy and I'm going to grab that. Pittsburgh minus 6.5 at Cincy. Total in the game set at 39 points. To me, this is pretty well a perfect total. But again, where this head-to-head -head matchup is kind of skewing a bit towards the under, like we just mentioned, uh, three straight unders in six of the last eight. I think I'm going to lean under on this one as well. Go under 39 points in Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. Let's go Steelers 24, Bengals 14. Well, I suppose I could have waited because the very next game we're talking about Cleveland. Let's go to Cleveland. Browns on the long week off of that win against Pittsburgh. They get to stay at home and welcome in the Miami Dolphins. And that is a very nice feeling, I'm sure, for the Cleveland Browns. Not going to talk about this game very much. If there's any matchup where you can trust the Cleveland Browns on the offensive side or the defensive side, it's got to be against Miami, despite the fact that, you know, Miami's won like two games in their last five. Like they're showing that they've got at least a little something, but what they don't have is anything resembling an NFL defense. Cleveland, no matter who is out there for them offensively, should be able to eat the Dolphins alive in this matchup. We're going to be taking the Cleveland Browns at home despite the fact that they're under 500 at home we're going to take the Browns to beat Miami
On the line, the Cleveland Browns are 11 point favorites against Miami, and that number is gross. Like, that number is disgusting because it's like, okay, it's Miami. So, you know, double digit points, it makes sense. But then it's like, Cleveland, how in the world could you, if you're a better, how in the world can you trust the Cleveland Browns? Other than using what I like to call MMA math, which is, well, they just beat the Steelers last week by 14, so sure they'll beat the Dolphins by 11, which is the the worst, the worst logical fallacy you could possibly use. How can you trust that Cleveland Browns team to cover 11 points? Like the onus is on the favorite to cover the points. I can't, I can't give it to them. The Dolphins, to their credit, are actually 3-1 and one against the spread away from home this year. Now, granted, some of those have been bigger numbers than this. But I think I have to hold my nose from this disgusting, awful shit smell and actually take the Dolphins plus the 11 points. Because can you imagine if Miami wins this game? <gasps> Total in the game is set at 44 points. This is right around where I capped it personally. This is a coin flip for me, but I think I'm going to skew on the under here because at any point, either one of these teams could put up a field goal only. So I'm going to stick under on it. We're going to go under 44 points in Miami, Cleveland. Let's go Browns 26, Dolphins 17. Let's go to New Orleans now for another divisional matchup. Saints at home playing host to the Carolina Panthers. Panthers now losers of two consecutive games. And all of a sudden that offense doesn't look all that good. Maybe teams have finally figured out the things that they're doing with Christian McCaffrey. And they've kind of figured out Kyle Allen as a quarterback. He may not be the answer that most people were thinking that he might be. They might wind up regretting that decision in a position here where, you know, the wild card is not completely out of the question at least saints rebounded from their loss a couple of weeks ago to put up a victory last week they sit at eight and two comfortably in the lead in that division i mean they doubled up tampa bay last week they looked pretty darn good so it's got to be a comfortable feeling because you know there's a little bit at least has to be a little bit of unease around that new orleans team like this team doesn't look quite as good as i feel like it should of note, the Panthers did win the last head-to-head -head matchup that these two teams had, but that win snapped a four-game Saints winning streak head-to-head. -head. It is worth noting as well, the Panthers have covered the last three against the spread. Tough for me to pick against the Saints here, even though the Panthers do have a winning record away from home. They've only won one of their three division matchups. I think the Saints win this football game. I think it's a good showcase game for the Saints as we head towards the playoffs. Let's take New Orleans at home to beat the Panthers for Carolina's third straight loss. On the line, Saints are nine and a half point favorites at home, which almost feels as gross to me as the Cleveland Miami line simply because this is a Carolina Panthers team that has shown that they're capable on both sides of the football this season they've had trouble putting them all together necessarily but still they've shown that they're capable on both sides so for them to be giving up nine and a half points even though they're on the road that's a really tough one for me but I'm gonna hold my nose and I'm gonna take the favorite line here if it is going to be that showcase game for the Saints that I mentioned earlier, they should put up enough points, I would think, to cover this number. And let's see that defense start playing some more New Orleans Saints defense. So I, I'm going to take that number. I'm going to have the Saints lay the nine and a half points. New Orleans minus 9.5. Total in the game set at 47 points. I've got this game capped right around here. It's a high 40, kind of pushing 50. But like I mentioned a little bit earlier, these teams... Actually, sorry, I didn't mention this. Head-to-head, -head, four of the last five matchups have gone over on numbers in the mid-40s. So granted, this is like... A little bit higher than that, but I do feel comfortable telling you to go over. I think this game pushes 50 points. I think it gets there. So let's go over 47 points in Carolina, New Orleans. Let's go Saints 30, Panthers 20. Let's go to New York now. Jets are going to play host to the Oakland Raiders. Oakland, all of a sudden, you know, playing some pretty darn good football. The Raiders are winners of three consecutive games and don't look now, but they're only a game behind the Chiefs for this division. Like, look, 
had the Chiefs lost to the Chargers on Monday Night Football, the Oakland Raiders would be leading this division at 6-4. and four. The Raiders are right there playing their best football of the season. They're also 5-1 and one at home this year, so they're getting the job done in their own building. Unfortunately, they are on the road this week, but the Raiders are getting the job done to a degree greater than I thought they would be this season. Jets enter this game just at three and seven, but they are winners of two straight games. They are under 500 at home, so they're not exactly the most reliable home team, but look, I told you they were gonna beat the Redskins last week. I certainly didn't think they were gonna double them up. But boy, based on the way the Raiders have turned things around here in the second half of the season, um, I, it's tough for me to bet against them, even though the game's in New York. I think I got to take the Raiders here to keep pressure on the Kansas City Chiefs, because again, the Chiefs are off this week. If the Raiders, oh my God, I can't even believe I'm saying this. If the Raiders want to keep their best chances alive of winning this division, they have to take advantage of this while the Chiefs are not playing. Let's take the Raiders on the road in New York to beat the Jets. On the line, Jets are three-point dogs at home, so obviously the Raiders only laying three points as the favorite. I like them to win. It's a small price to pay. Let's lay those three points. Take Oakland minus three. Total in the game set at 45 and a half points. I've only got this capped around a high 30, maybe pushing a 40. I do think it gets to 40, but I do think it stays under. So we're going to stay under 45 and a half points in Oakland, New York. Let's go Raiders 25. Jets 15. Let's go to Washington now for the aforementioned Redskins who dropped that 34 to 17 decision against the Jets last week. They are at home taking on the Detroit Lions and Detroit, man, that quarterback situation in Detroit, the news got a lot worse this week. Obviously Washington's a bad football team. I don't you don't need me to tell you that. The Lions now drop to 3-6 and 1, losers of 3 straight and getting the news that Matt Stafford's back injury, those fractured bones in his back, a similar injury to what he had and played through last season. It looks like he could miss upwards of six weeks, retroactive a couple of weeks. So we may not see him again until week 16 or 17. And by that point, I mean, Detroit's going to be out of any conversation for anything. So you might as well just shut him down for the rest of the year if you're really concerned about the health that much. This is basically Jeff Driscoll's football team now. However, if Driscoll does fumble a little bit, they do have a rookie college free agent behind him. That is David Blow. And I know that's not how you pronounce his last name. I'm pretty sure it's Bloff or Blah or Blau or something. But I'm going to call him David Blow. So when you're choosing between Jeff Driscoll or David Blow, uh, things are not looking good for you. Now, some injury news on Washington's sideline as well. Defensive tackle Deron Payne, one of their better pass rushers on the season, injured his ankle last week. As of yesterday, he was still in a walking boot. His status for this game very much uncertain. That could really affect Washington's pass rush. But folks, you know how much of a fan I am of the upsets. I very much believe in the rule of four, even though it did fail me last week and has failed me three times on the season. I'm still very much a believer in that rule. Certain upsets happen every single week. Call it a gut when you're facing a Lions team that has uh, injury at quarterback, injury at running back. This is basically Kenny Galladay and his band of misfit toys. This is a defense that is bad. This is a bad defense that cannot hold leads even when they get it. I think the Redskins win this game. Call me an idiot. I'm cool with that. I think Washington wins it. I'm taking the Redskins to beat Detroit at home. On the line, the Skins are getting three and a half points as a home underdog. I'm happy to take that where I like them to win the game outright. Let's go Washington plus 3.5. Total in the game set at 42 and a half points. Pretty well another perfect total as far as I'm concerned. This is a coin flip, but I'm going to lean on the over side of it. Even if it's like a really late in the game backdoor over, I think that's what we wind up getting. We're going to go over 42 and a half points in Washington, Detroit. Hold your nose for this game, folks. Redskins 22, Lions 21. And if all three of those touchdowns come from Kenny Galladay, I don't think any of us are going to be surprised. Let's go to San Francisco now, one of the premier matchups in the NFC. 
the San Francisco 49ers playing host to the Green Bay Packers. Green Bay coming into this game off of their bye. San Francisco coming in a little beat up. Green Bay sitting at 8-2, and two, still leading the NFC North division despite the fact that Minnesota is also at 8 wins. So this is going to be tight right down to the wire as far as I'm concerned. Minnesota on bye this week, hoping for the Niners to do them a huge favor. San Francisco got back on the happy side of par after suffering their first loss of the season a few weeks back. Niners now sitting at 9-1, and one, but man, they still got the Seahawks breathing down their neck at 8-2. and two. As I mentioned, a number of injuries for the San Francisco 49ers heading into this game. We don't really know when George Kittle is going to be coming back. Uh, Debu Samuel, I believe, left the game last week. But the big one for the Niners is D. Ford on the defensive line. He suffered a hamstring injury, which right now is being feared to be a multi-week injury injury so obviously his status for this game very much in doubt it seems very unlikely that he's going to play and d ford is one of their better pass rushers so if you are not having as much success as you could be pass rushing aaron Rodgers, it's possible that you're going to have a bad time now I can already hear that one dude in my comments going, oh my God, he's going to pick the Packers because he's such a homer and oh my God, it's getting awful listening to this guy. And you know what? Look, maybe I shouldn't pay attention to those people, but as much as I pay attention to the people that leave me really nice and great comments and constructive criticism and stuff we can talk about, I'm still very much that person that's just like, I have to pay attention to this jackass. I don't know why I wind up being that kind of person. Uh, But I will say this flat out. The Green Bay Packers right now are the fifth worst total defense in the NFL. Their defense has taken a measurable step back in the last four to five to six weeks. And uh, I don't think they have a defense that hangs with San Francisco, especially if George Kittle does come back and play this week. Now, obviously, they held him out last week. He's dealing with multiple lower body injuries, but he's had plenty of time to get those rested. This game has been flexed to Sunday night football, so he's got a few extra hours to kind of get himself ready. I figure he will very much be a game time decision, but my feeling is that George Kittle is going to play. And I just don't think the Packers defense keeps up with what the 49ers are capable of doing on the offensive side of the ball. If the game was in Green Bay, I might feel differently, but I think I got to go with the 49ers in this one. Let's go San Francisco to beat Green Bay. On the line, the Niners are only a three-point favorite at home. I like them to win. It's a small price to pay. Let's grab those three points and go San Francisco minus three. Total in the game set at 46 points. I have this capped at like a high 40, maybe pushing a 50. I do actually think it gets there. So it's a little bit of a lean, but we're going to go over 46 points in San Francisco Green Bay, as I certainly expect Aaron Rodgers will put up his points as well. Let's take San Francisco 30, Green Bay 21. And the last game we're going to look at before we get to the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks for week 12 is the Los Angeles Rams playing host to the Baltimore Ravens. Rams are now 6-4 and four on the season, coming off that aforementioned 10-point victory at home against Chicago last week. Rams are trying to keep their playoff hopes here alive. They're at 6-4, and four, but they are, you know, far from what I would call a lock to kind of get in as a wildcard spot. Right now, they're two games back of the wildcard, an ultra, ultra competitive wildcard in the NFC. Meanwhile, Baltimore finds themselves three full games clear of the Pittsburgh Steelers for the AFC North title. They are winners of six consecutive games, playing some of the best Baltimore Ravens football that I have ever seen the Ravens play. Like, this team is a legitimate Super Bowl threat. I'm just going to say it. Ravens have beaten both of their NFC opponents so far this season, and I just don't see much of a reason not to take Baltimore in this matchup. That offense is just doing too much right now. That defense is playing really good, hard-nosed defense. I think they keep Jared Goff and the Rams offense at bay. They really double down to stop Todd Gurley on the ground. I think Baltimore wins this game, and I'm not going to call it a walk, but I do think they win the game comfortably. We're going to take the Ravens on the road in Los Angeles to beat the Rams. On the line, Rams are a three-point dog at home. Baltimore laying three points as the favorite. I like them to win. It's a small price to pay. Let's grab Baltimore minus the three points. 
Total in the game is 46 and a half. I feel pretty good about this game going over. I think it hits 50 points. A little bit of a lean maybe if you want to call it that. But let's go over 46 and a half points in Baltimore, LA. Let's go Ravens 29, Rams 21. Okay, folks, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks for week 12 in the NFL. We'll start with the bronze pick where we are under 500 across the board, four and seven straight up, only two and nine against the spread, and four and seven on the totals. Let's turn this bad boy around starting this week. It is not too late. We are going to take the Buffalo Bills and Denver Broncos game as our bronze pick. Buffalo is the host team here. Broncos coming into this matchup on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games. They were losers last week. Buffalo dealing with a little bit of an injury concern. The Bills at 7-3 and three still kind of controlling their own destiny here in terms of an AFC wild card. They did their job last week against a division rival against Miami, beating the Dolphins 37-20. to 20. And for the Buffalo Bills to put up 37 points in one game, certainly a good sign for that offense. John Brown had himself a hell of a game. The Broncos dropped a very competitive four-point decision in Minnesota last week, so they're back on the losing side after winning the week before. And uh, look, it's just going to be, I think, a tough road for that Broncos offense to get a lot of points or get enough points to win against what is still a really, really good Buffalo Bills defense. One way I do think the Broncos might keep this game close is in the pass rush department, especially given that the Bills' right tackle... Ty Naseki, I believe is how you pronounce it, N-S-E-K-H-E. -E. I'm going to call it Naseki, Ty Naseki. Injured his ankle. They're still testing it. His status is uncertain for this game. They've got a rookie right tackle behind him, so you could definitely see some exploitation of that on the line of scrimmage. Denver, I think, keeps this game close because both of these defenses are really, really good. Buffalo's not going to be putting up any 37-point performances this week. But I do still like the Bills at home in a good spot against a Broncos team that has not found a lot of success away from home this season. Let's take Buffalo at home to beat Denver. On the line, Bills are only four-point favorite. It's under a touchdown. I think that's a pretty realistic representation of the difference between these two teams. More than realistic, I would say. Denver's going to have to rely entirely on their defense to keep this game close. But I think Buffalo covers the minus four. So we are going to lay those four points on the Buffalo Bills. Total in the game set at 37.5 points. I have this thing reaching like 25, maybe. So I feel real good about sticking under in this game. Not a lot of points to be had. It is going to be a game of inches. We are going to stay under 37 and a half points in Buffalo, Denver. Let's go Buffalo 16, Broncos 7. Bills straight up. We're going to hammer the Bills minus four against the spread in a game that stays under 37 and a half points. That is your bronze pick. My silver pick, Ryan, 8-3 and three straight up, but now a single game under 500, both against the spread and over under, sees the Tennessee Titans playing host to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, Jags on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games, lost in Nick Foles' return to the team, Tennessee coming into the game off of their bye. I just feel like there are a lot of things that are working in Tennessee's favor in this game. Winner of this game is very much still going to be alive in the AFC wildcard race. They'll be about a game, maybe two games back. Certainly nothing decided there at all. Jags, it's probably a little more important for the Jags at four and six than it is for the Titans at five and five. But the Jags have lost two straight games. Tennessee won their last time out. Tennessee's got the better offense. Tennessee's got the better defense. Tennessee's above 500 at home. The Jags are under 500 on the road. Maybe this does feel like one of those situations where like it's I should treat it like the Chargers. Like the more things that tell me the Chargers are going to win, the less I should bet on them kind of thing. It's 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 that team is so weird. But uh, I, I just feel really good about the Tennessee Titans here. Jacksonville did win the last head-to-head -head matchup, but that snapped a four-game Titans winning streak. So I think I'm going to lean on who I legitimately think is the better team. I think that's the Tennessee Titans. I think they're going to be able to run the ball down Jacksonville's throat and keep running the ball down their throat. Titans beat the Jags. On the line, Tennessee is only laying three points here as the favorite. I like them to win. It's a small price to pay. Let's take Tennessee minus the three points. 
Total in the game set at 41 and a half. I've got this game at like a high 30, maybe pressing a 40. So this is pretty well a perfect total, but it is worth noting head to head three of the last four games have gone under on numbers just like this like high 30s low 40s so these two teams are used to playing with numbers like that and they're still hitting unders so i do think the game stays under the 41 and a half point total that's the way that we're going to go let's go titans 24 jags 15 Titans straight up. We're going to hammer the Titans minus three against the spread in a game that goes under 41 and a half points. That is your silver pick. My gold pick, Ryan, nine and two straight up, but only three and eight against the spread and five and six on the total. Sees the Philadelphia Eagles at home playing host to the Seattle Seahawks, which is going to be one of the marquee games of the week. I think this is going to be a hotly contested, I mean, most games are hotly contested, but this one in particular, the Battle of the Birds, if you will. Philadelphia obviously trying to keep pace with Dallas in the in that division and uh seattle continuing to lay their claim to what probably the top wild card spot seattle comes into this game off their bye and winners of three straight games that defense is certainly not what it has been in years past but russell wilson and the offense has been doing enough to keep them competitive in most games and just winning these kind of track meet type of games and i feel like that's what this game is going to be the Eagles were losers last week, dropping a 17 to 10 decision at home against the New England Patriots. A very, very close football game. Everybody gets up to play New England. But I mean, it's worth noting the Eagles under 500 this season against NFC opponents. So granted, it's not a division game, but this is still a team that they face with relative frequency. And in those games against NFC opponents, they're under 500. Both of these teams, similar situation, different contexts. Like in the context of the NFC East division, yes, the Eagles are only one game back of the Cowboys. Yes, they must feel a desperate need to win this game because if they don't win that division, chances are they're not making the playoffs as a wildcard team. You look at the Seahawks, they're a game behind the 49ers in the context of the NFC West. They could still conceivably win that division, but the record's much different. Obviously, San Francisco 9-1, and one, Seattle 8-2. and two. I mean, Seattle could be looking at potentially a first-round bye or being in the first-round bye conversation if they happen to win that division. If not, they'd probably get the top wildcard seed, but they'd have to play a division winner. So, I mean, they could wind up playing a Green Bay or a New Orleans. More than likely, they'd probably wind up playing Dallas, but still... They want that comfort. Any team would want that comfort of having the first round by. And I think the thing that really tipped the scales in one direction was the injury note for the Philadelphia Eagles right tackle Lane Johnson. And that's not a nothing name. That's one of the better right tackles in the NFL, if not you know, among the two or three best. He suffered a concussion last week against New England. He is in protocol. His status is very much uncertain. If he were not to play, I think the Seahawks pass rush is going to find a way to get home more often than normal against the Eagles. If that happens, I think Seattle wins this football game, even though they're the underdog. And we'll talk about that when we get to the line. But I'm taking the Seattle Seahawks, trusting that offense, trusting Russell Wilson, Seahawks over the Eagles. On the line, like I mentioned, Eagles only laying a point and a half as a favorite at home. I like Seattle to win, so I'm more than happy to take that point and a half against the spread. Seahawks plus 1.5. Total in the game set at 48 points. I've got this thing capped to like a low to mid 50, so I feel fairly good about going over on this number. It's a big number at 48, relatively big anyway, but we will go over on 48 points in Seattle, Philadelphia. Let's go Seattle 30, Philadelphia 23. Seahawks straight up. We're taking the Seahawks plus a point and a half against the spread in a game that goes over 48 points. That is your gold pick and your platinum pick where I'm 10 and one straight up, but only four and seven against the spread and three and eight on the totals. Sees the New England Patriots at home playing host to the Dallas Cowboys. Another very, you know, a, a matchup of division leaders, you know, two of the better teams, I would say, two of the top maybe 10 to 12 teams in the league, but there's an injury concern for Dallas and it's not an insignificant one. Cowboys also coming in on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games. 
And like their division cohorts in Philadelphia, Dallas's injury concern comes on the offensive line and his left tackle, Lael Collins, who had a little bit of injury issue earlier on in the season. It's a knee injury. It's the same knee that he had the MCL sprain in earlier this season that cost him at least one game, if not, I think it was one game in a bit. So same knee, you always worry about re- injury re-aggravation there. His status is uncertain. If it's up to me, Lael Collins is not playing this week. So given an offensive line injury, given still being on the road for back-to-back games and coming off of a win on the road last week, I just really like the Patriots in this spot. It's a, it's a contextual spot. I probably would have been taking the Patriots anyway, but where you have these mitigating factors against the Dallas Cowboys, we're going to take the New England Patriots as my platinum pick. Patriots beat the Cowboys. On the line, Patriots are laying six and a half points as the home favorite against Dallas. And I realize that Dak Prescott and that offense through the air has been doing some fantastic things the last few weeks. I think it's like over, well over 800 yards passing over the last few weeks. But I, I got to take that. I got to take the Patriots under a touchdown. I mean, against almost anybody in the league. Uh, you think you got to take the Patriots at home under a touchdown. So I'm going to lay that six and a half points and I'm going to take the Patriots minus 6.5 total in the game set at 46 points. I have this game right around a low to mid 40. So it's pretty darn close to this number. It's a little bit of a lean, but I think I'm going to stay under on it under 46 points in Dallas, New England. Let's go Patriots 29 Cowboys just 14. Let's see that Patriots defense ball out a little more. Patriots straight up. We're going to hammer the Patriots minus six and a half against the spread in a game that stays under 46 points. That is your platinum pick. There you go, folks. Your picks are in for week 12 of the 2019 NFL season, and it is time now for the patented comment of the week. Comment of the week from the week 12 episode goes to my good friend, West Coast Martin, one of the better just people overall in general in this community. West Coast Martin, my friend Martin, he had this comment on the week tw- week 11 sorry episode last week. Justin, I hope you're right on your Raider pick. I just think they will play down to their opponent, making it a much closer game than I would want. Well, in a, well, I mean, luckily they 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 won that game now maybe they did play down to cincinnati a little bit because they did only win that game by seven points and aside from picking it correctly straight up i did miss both of the betting picks last week on oakland but hopefully martin you're happy with the raiders with the win last week what was it their third straight win and hopefully you're equally as happy that yours is the comment of the week from the week 11 episode All right, folks, the Week 12 episode is now in the books. I hope you enjoyed it. hope you enjoy the games this weekend. Making sure that this weekend you do divert your attention just for a few hours to Grey Cup 107 between the Hamilton Ticats and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. They are facing off for the CFL Championship, the Grey Cup, one of the most coveted trophies in Canadian sports. I hope you will take a few hours, at the very least, if you don't watch any other CFL throughout the whole season, watch the Grey Cup because what a game that always is. Enjoy the rest of the games in Week 12. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and we will see you again for Lucky, maybe, Week number 13. Don't worry, that punishment's coming.